Please welcome Andrew Hacker. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Arun. Can everyone hear me okay? Good afternoon. So yeah, this is my challenge. Although everybody looks kind of bright and starry-eyed, nobody looks sleepy. So. So that's a good thing, a very delicious lunch. And thank you very much to Phoenix Contact for allowing me to, to spend some time with you guys and you know, go through my musing and my thoughts. And um, as Arun mentioned, um, my last name is Hacker. Uh, never offended by any jokes about a hacker, a person with the last name of Hacker being a cybersecurity professional. I've come, tried to come up with all kinds of you know, funny jokes myself, but I don't even bother anymore. <laughs> So um, in addition to being the founder and CEO of Thought Networks, which is an artificial intelligence blockchain solution, and I'll go into a little bit to what that actually means, um, I am also the cybersecurity expert in residence at Harrisburg University. And for those of you who are not familiar with, with HU, as we call it, uh, Harrisburg University is sort of a startup college that's been around for 11 to 12 years now in downtown Harrisburg on Market Street. Um, which is primarily and completely a STEM college. So everything that we do is <clears throat> oriented around science, technology, and, and all that comes with it, um, but also very much a startup culture, right? So the university is, you know, <clears throat> growing immensely fast. When I came on board, <clears throat> uh, for those of you who might not know about the history, um, it was, you know, a local Harrisburg and state initiative to sort of build this science and technology university and they, they've had their struggles. And when I came on board, they were just kind of pulling out of, you know, not having any cash. And now they're very cash positive. Their enrollments are up significantly year to year, expanding globally. Um, just opened up uh, a center in Philadelphia and, you know, getting plugged into the technology ecosystem there. So a lot of great things. And many of you might have heard that we actually just broke ground on a sister building, which will be a 17 story building downtown Harrisburg, focused on healthcare and, and nursing um, technologies and the like. So. Uh, a lot of great things happening there. <clears throat> as far as Harrisburg University's involvement with the startup, um, Harrisburg University and the president, Eric Dar, actually, um, it was funny, I'll go into a little bit of history. So I was the deputy CISO for Pennsylvania. So basically second in command for cybersecurity for the entire state of PA and all the agencies. And just a little bit about how things have changed, even in the last five years, and, it, and even today with all the presentations from everybody, from you know, Kevin and Carl uh, and Kurt, you know, cybersecurity is actually a thing now, right? So when I first started with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it was probably 20, 2010 I started. And we were the bad guys back then. So it was a little bit of you know, Wild West cowboy kind of stuff when we go into the room you know, you remember the old Western, the people, the guys that come out with arrows in their hats. That's what it was, right? So I would go into a room with chief information officers of these major agencies like PennDOT, like Liquor Control Board, like Department of Public Welfare, you know, millions and millions of dollars in budget. <clears throat> and that's just their IT budgets. And then we'd have to come in and say, oh, by the way, you know, that big project that you're spending millions of dollars on, you can't do that, right? Um, obviously, you know, over time, things change. So, you know, for me, I, I actually kind of feel like I am the grandpa here in the cybersecurity world, which is amazing because five, ten years ago, I was just, you know, the, the new guy, right? Um, you know, what's changed is awareness of cybersecurity has, has gone up tremendously. And no thanks, you know, a, a, you know, a thankless job, but all of the breaches helped with that, right? So the CIOs used to hate us. Right. And they, they would yell at us and say, oh, you know, how can you say that? And, you know, the cybersecurity professionals sort of changed our tune a little bit more to like, well, OK, let's you know, work with you on how you can do this. Right. Um, but eventually, you know, within the last three, four years, it was basically help us. Right. So, you know, these CIOs and, and Kurt had put up the, <clears throat> um, the slide there about Target. Right. So, I mean. Everybody got fired from Target when that happened. Their stock drove, uh, Q, one of the quarters there, dropped 40%. Um, two board members got fired, the CEO got fired, and the CIO got fired. I think the CISO did not, so good for them. But point is, you know, cybersecurity is now think, something that anyone who's in IT generally needs now, right? And salaries have been going up, which is a great story for HU because uh, there's definitely a shortage of um, talent out there for people that know cybersecurity, so um, it's a great field. <clears throat> so today we're here talking about infrastructure, and I'm going to take 
you know, go up a, a, you know, a couple levels and be more general about infrastructure. Um, you know, a lot of good presentations, a lot of great cybersecurity information today. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, I've been talking about for years and, and I'm great, you know, it's great to see everybody, you know, thinking along the same lines of best practices and, you know, users, good, bad, or otherwise for cybersecurity. So, <clears throat> um, I thought I'd kind of take a step back and let's, let's kind of define what infrastructure is because I think that's a very interesting question, right? So, how do we define infrastructure? What is an infrastructure? Right, you know, basic, most general Webster's definition there is a basic or organizational structure and facilities that go along with it, right? <clears throat> that can apply to anything, right? So when we think of infrastructure, what do we think of? Give me, you know, shout it out, what's an infrastructure? Roadways, what was that? Transportation, sure, right? Um, airports, roadways, bridges, what else? Networking, okay, so IT, right? So <clears throat> network, routers, bridges, ethernet connectivity, right? Um, what about your skeletal bones in your body? That's kind of an infrastructure, right? It supports everything that your body does, okay? Um, and what are the impact of some of these infrastructures? That's something else that's very interesting and, and certainly ties into cybersecurity because uh, you know, maybe the more important something is, the more that somebody who's protecting it needs to either, you know, expend in resources to protect it, right? Um, <clears throat> so when we think of infrastructures, you know, there's so many different types of infrastructures, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what the definition of an infrastructure is and how it's changed over time. And I think digitization in general, when I say that, I mean, you know, things that are physical, right, that are kind of in the physical plane, and, you know, we have this notion of physical plane and digital plane, right? So, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, everything was physical, right? I mean, you know, electricity and transmission, you know, when did that start? Mid-18th century, and, you know, forgive me for my history, I'm a big, you know, Tesla and uh, um, fan about how that whole story happened and who won the AC and the DC wars and all that great stuff. <clears throat> but, you know, today I think we're seeing um, the predominance and the explosion of digital more than any time, you know, in our history, right? Almost everything is digital now, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and, you know, this kind of goes back to what I was saying about, you know, of infrastructure just basically being, a, you know, an, an underlying facilitator of something that happens on top of it. Um, I, funny enough, I was just talking about this, which is why I included this cross section here. Um, I was running with somebody and we got on to off topic about <clears throat> the layers in New York City and how you go down, lo you know, lower in layers under New York and it gets older and older, you know, like, you know, uh, pavement and then under that you might have, you know, bricks or, you know, cobblestone streets, right? So, I mean, if you look at New York City, you know, power, cable, water, gas, you know, transportation, the subways, sewage, and, you know, even all the way down. I can't even read what the number of feet is there, but all the way down the bedrock, they've got, you know, the water tunnels, right? So this is just some examples of the things that we think of with the infrastructure. So let's throw out another definition. <clears throat> you know, gen there's general infrastructure, right? Um, you could even think of infrastructure as your home network, right? How many people have more than four devices connected to their home network? Okay, how many more than 10? More than 20? Okay, <laughs> so I've got four boys between the age of six and 11, <clears throat> and between all of them, I, I can't keep track anymore, but you know, tablets and you know, PlayStation, uh, Nintendo Switch, you know, whatever. I've, I've probably got 25 devices on the network now, you know, even to the point where you know, I have my own SOC, my own management system within my house because <clears throat> they're always downloading games and you know, like as before with the aquarium, you know, they download one game and, you know, if that game starts attacking my other computers, that wouldn't be good. <clears throat> Excuse me. So back to critical infrastructure. Um, there, there is a distinction, you know, between a regular infrastructure and, and, you know, you could argue all infrastructure are important, but critical ones are the ones that when there's a negative impact to that infrastructure, the effects are very great. Okay, so there's a lot of different definitions and a number of critical infrastructures as defined by either large corporations or, you know, 
um, nation states and governments and the US government they you know varies over time but generally you know in the 10 to 16 range um, you know they change classifications but you can kind of see them here so chemical you know chemical infrastructure chemical plants and a lot of these things <clears throat> Phoenix contact touches in one way or another with with its controllers communications certainly right um, cellular you know POTS um, T1 lines all of these communication infrastructures are you know everything goes down what happens right certainly you know waterworks dams power generation emergency services financial services right I mean now I would say you know 90 to 95 percent is probably even higher of all transactions happen are digital right I mean who who goes into a store with a $20 bill in their pocket anymore, right? How many times have I wanted cash? I don't even think I carry cash half the time, right? So what happens if these digital services get affected? They get hacked, they go down, um, they get turned off, right? Um, commercial facilities, manufacturing, certainly. Um, energy grid, extremely important. Uh, and certainly healthcare, right? So healthcare systems now, you know, I don't know what the percentage number is with um, health records, but you know they're probably all digital. Most of them now. I mean, maybe a few holdouts are still using paper. Uh, nuclear, nuclear is huge, um, and you know maybe some of the nuclear power plants in the United States might be closing down for one reason or another. But generally speaking, I mean, think about what nuclear represents from a risk standpoint, right? And that's how we have to kind of think of this. It's it's critical in the respect that. If something bad happens to that system, there can be a lot of bad effects with that, okay? So basically when I say critical infrastructure, it means anything where the impact of you know, both the positive and the negative aspects of that infrastructure are very large. Okay, quiz time. Who could tell me what that is a picture of? Yep, TMI, correct. Okay, so that's TMI. Um, found this on Google Images, so I didn't, you know, I didn't get in there and take it because I'd probably be thrown at Guantanamo. <clears throat> but yes, that is uh, Three Mile Island, the control system. And for those of you who might not know it, there are two of them. There's the main one, and then across the street they actually have a practice one. So it's a replica, full scale, 100% replica of that control room for trainees for new engineers. This is uh, the bonus question. Who can tell me what's special about that control room? Kind of almost can see it from, from this viewpoint. Correct. There is not one computer in that control system other than for simulation. In the, in the uh, practice control room, they have computers that turn stuff on and off for simulations. But this is all analog, meaning it's all you know electro actuated. Um, you can liken it to, um, you know, with the the railway system. You know, the switches are all now part of a bigger control system, but they used to be manual, right? You just go up and switch it, or there was some electromagnetic connection that we changed. Now, this is a great thing. Um, I was in the the training control room, and it was amazing to me. I've, I've never seen anything that complex in my life. I mean, some of the code I work with is sure, but you're sitting in a room with thousands and thousands and thousands of readouts and controls, and it was amazing to me that this was all analog, right? But from a cybersecurity perspective, I and mean, there was a lot of talk before about, you know, what's the most secure computer system on the planet, the one that's not plugged into a network, right? Or doesn't have any inputs and outputs, and that's exactly essentially what this is. There's no modems for someone to break into, it's not connected to a network, it's certainly not accessible by the internet, and I'm actually pretty glad about that. So as I was talking about the, the changes over time with infrastructure and, and why it's important is, is basically we went from complete physical and so-called analog to digital, right? So the change is bits, right? And you know, I'm oversimplifying that, but you know, here's an aqueduct from, from Rome uh, and here's you know, the new age or at least you know, more new um, water distribution system, right? And there's you know, all kinds of electronic devices that are there measuring, sensing, adjusting, right? So there's lots of inputs, there's lots of outputs. There's some kind of control system there. It may be you know, put together by one company or several, right? 
those companies might have contractual relationships with each other. They're certainly not necessarily integrated. Um, but the point is, is that things that before we took for granted as not being connected, not being digital, are being now digital, right? Um, perfect example, I probably don't know one phone number anymore. I think I know my own and my wife's, which is good. But, you know, I have my phone, my contact list, and I don't have to memorize a phone number because I have it. What happens if that phone goes away, <laughs> right? Or even bills, bill pay now, cars, right? I mean, everything in a car, most things, and this is something uh, I did last year with um, this um, same conference last year was, was about um, autonomous vehicles. Uh, and there was a 2015 Jeep Cherokee. Uh, and instead of being physical systems, right? So you press on a brake pedal, you know, pushes the actuator on a master cylinder, pushes liquid out to the, the slaves, right? That's not how it is anymore. It's an electrical solenoid that converts that signal into something that actuates the cylinder, right? Same with steering. So in this video, I showed how they were able actually, you know, sitting on the side of a road with a computer, connect to this Jeep Cherokee, steer it, brake it, accelerate it, turn it off, lock the doors, right? Now that kind of stuff's scary. And, and Kevin brought the, the perfect point is, a lot of these companies are building this really amazing technology. Either they don't have the money or they're not aware of the fact that they need to be cyber secure. And that's the scary part, right? So the holistic approach is extremely important in saying, you know, anything that's digital now, anything that's software, anything that's connected needs to have basic cybersecurity principles in place. <clears throat> so just to take a little look at some, I mean, just, did I skip something here now? Uh, infrastructure attacks, and these are just, you know, sampling. And, you know, I used to be that guy, it used to be part of my job and a requirement for me to be, you know, the scary cybersecurity guy and talk about hacks and breaches and negative impacts, and I'm, hopefully I'm kind of graduating on and moving on, so I don't need to scare people so much anymore, which is great, because now we can move on to more productive things. Um, but just to kind of put this in perspective, you know, we're looking at all these various systems, and this is global, so these are all kinds of organizations and entities and utilities across the globe. Um, 230,000 people, no power, because a SCADA system was connected to the internet, and you, you know, you've seen before that you can just search these things, right? And they're discoverable by machines, right, that do it pretty quickly and efficiently. Um, a dam attack, 2013, report, reported in 2016. So the attack and the, the, um, the danger was there three years before anybody knew about it. That happens a lot in cybersecurity. People don't report. Um, or something only comes out because they're required by, you know, some regulation to put it on a financial statement. <clears throat> Nuclear power plants. So spear phishing, spear phishing is a human thing. It's, uh, I sent a, you know, a specially crafted email to either a group of people or a specific person to get them to give up credentials, right? And then from there, they, you know, own or, you know, take over a particular system, they can jump to other systems. So, um, you know, all of these major breaches, whether it's Target or Home Depot, or, you know, a lot of the healthcare uh, breaches, you know, they're multi-pronged, multi-faceted. They start in one area, could, you know, pointed out, it could be a very simple device. It, um, how many of you have actually ever seen Mr. Robot? It's, um, it's a series, I'm, I'm even forgetting what network it's on, but it's about a, a hacker and, um, you know, he takes down the financial system. But one of the things he does is he takes a, a small device, the Raspberry Pi, I think it was in the, in the show, and he goes, you know, he basically walks in the front door of some organization, I think it was a data center, oh, they were um, like an Iron Mountain um, backup system where they were storing stuff, and he went to the closet and hooked this Raspberry Pi onto the thermostat, and from that he was able to break into the data center. So um, most of the stuff in that series are actually, a lot of the hacks are true. Um, cybersecurity people that watch it, they say, oh, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's pretty real, so pretty accurate. If you're ever interested, it's, it's a pretty interesting show. But the point is, is that, you know, really it's, it's any device these days. Uh, and I, I will take this time to point out that um, the power and the size of computing is the power is growing so fast and the size and the cost factor are shrinking so fast that, I mean, really, unless, you know, everybody's got this cybersecurity mentality, we're not going to get a handle on this. You know, their device is so small and so cheap now, um, you know, they could fit in anything, right? You know, and you've seen this, you know, even in 
Um, Home Depot now you can buy nests and you can buy ring on your front door. Uh, and a whole other topic of conversation that I, I usually do is big on the privacy thing. So cybersecurity kind of goes hand in hand with privacy, right? Um, you know, the more we sense and the more we see and do digitally, the more the privacy concerns go up. So there was actually some reports of Amazon coaching people to give away their neighbors. Or there was actually, they gave local police advice on how to get people to give up their ring video stream if something happened, right? So cool. I mean, you know, you might buy the ring so I can watch my front porch, but you know, I didn't, un you know, nobody would really recognize it. Amazon also said, oh, well, there's other five other houses there that I can see. And what are they doing with that data? Is it, you know, I can see when this person gets up and leaves and goes to work in the morning, you know, what kind of car they drive so they can sell them more stuff. Another conversation. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, some other areas, energy sector, SWIFT. Okay, so who knows what SWIFT is? Okay, so SWIFT is, you know, pretty much for now, anyway, the communication system for finance, financial transactions, right? It's, it's the main one anyway. Um, and, you know, any issue, problem with that can disrupt all kinds of things. And if, you know, you know with Pennsylvania State, they passed their budget on time this year. Amazing. They have had years where it's taken them one, two, I think four or five months was, was a pretty long one. But what happens then when that budget doesn't get passed? Everything grinds to a halt. People don't get paid, things don't happen, you know, things don't get produced that they should, things get shut down. So the financial infrastructure is extremely important. Um, Stuxnet, I'll, I'll talk about that quickly. Just gotta keep an eye on my time. Um, so the US supposedly manufactured a virus that broke into a control system and they used you know, video um, falsification to basically blow up their centrifuges. So that's the idea of you know, if something's connected, it's controllable electronically and remotely, people can do things with it that it wasn't intended. You know, spin up a motor too fast so it heats and burns out. You know, blow up, catch a printer on fire. You can do that remotely, right? So here, I can just go online and say, turn this, you know, voltage up to whatever, and then somebody house catches on fire. So that's, that's pretty scary stuff. Um, so this is an ATM machine. I don't know if you can see this, but it's Windows XP. As of 2014, no, as of 2019, 32% of organizations still have at least one Windows XP machine. The reason that's a big deal is because Windows XP went out of, or end of life in 2014. And the thing that they always say, and this is something that cybersecurity professionals know, is all the hackers were holding all of their zero day exploits in XP waiting for that day of EOL. Meaning that they didn't publish any before because then Microsoft would just fix them. They waited to EOL, and then they say, oh, okay, cool. And then, you know, all the people that still have it get broken into. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, this just happened um, the 14th. Um, Biostar is a security system by a South Korean company called Suprema. 28 million records, including plain text password, facial photos, which if anyone knows anything about the real ID, and the national ID in Pennsylvania, um, they are doing facial recognition now, right? And it was funny because I said to one of my coworkers, I said, oh, I'm not gonna get my real ID. I don't want my face fingerprinted. And it's like, oh, it doesn't matter. The camera they use even for the regular license still takes your facial recognition. So, oh, okay, well, that's, that's another, a whole other ball game. But so 28 million records, one company, okay, all of these, fingerprinty type pieces of information for building access, management, control. Look at all of the companies and regions that were affected by that one breach all across the globe. And look at the types of companies. I apologize if you can't read the, the dark print there, but <clears throat> co-working space, software development company, medical records company, um, gym franchise, plastics recycling, medical supply, cultural, festival, consumer groups. So you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> if there's consolidation of cybersecurity or you know, folks that are supposed to be protecting data and that stuff gets breached, the impact gets much larger. Okay, so generally speaking, one of the things that I see a lot of is that there is a lot of convergence. They talk about convergence 
um, you know, when is telephony going to merge with the network, right? And that, you know, that might be a false start, but eventually, you know, now we have VoIP phones all over the place, voice over IP, right? So the same kind of thing happens in, you know, a lot of different places, and maybe the timing is wrong. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. You know, they've been saying artificial intelligence is going to do all these great things for decades, right? They thought the big uh, explosion in AI was going to be in 1985. You know, I mean, the first real artificial intelligence early systems out of the 50s, right? Well, now it is actually happening. So, um, and that's a, another interesting area too. But generally speaking, for, for this conversation, you know, there are convergences of, you know, physical, electrical control systems, networking, um, you know, industrial Internet of Things, and general IoT. Um, and, you know, IT systems, they've been around for how many years, right? And, you know, generally speaking, corporations are moving towards having everything do everything. One size fits all. Um, I actually do some cybersecurity work for an IEEE um, development work group called Deterministic Networking. And that's exactly what they're doing is, you know, trying to bridge the gap between, okay, I've got the internet, I've got my private IP networks, and then I've got my control system networks. Right? And they don't necessarily work together. Um, control systems need some guarantees, right? Internet gives no guarantees. So this, this group, or work group, is looking to try to you know, give the characteristics of you know, your traditional control system networks onto things like the internet. So timing guarantees, bandwidth guarantees, latency guarantees, right? uptime guarantees. Um, and that's just you know one example of you know this convergence that's happening. So it's important um, from a cybersecurity perspective. It's good to see that a lot of these organizations and entities are definitely thinking about cyber. I mean, the, the deterministic networking work group said, "Well, we definitely need to do this," and nobody's really doing it. There's no standard out for it now. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I started cybersecurity, I think it was 2000, so almost 20 years ago. You know, there really weren't any standards for anything cybersecurity was like, change your passwords. Great, okay. But now, um, you know, 10, 15 years later, it's great to see there is a lot of activity. There are a lot of different frameworks out there. Um, you know, I don't even recommend, you know, in some level I still do, but you know, it's pretty much, hey guys, there's a lot of resources out there, a lot of companies that, are, that have cybersecurity in the forefront. So um, that's definitely good to see. <clears throat> so, you know, talking about that, um, here are some recommendations. Um, this is by um, a UK organization, NCSC, Cybersecurity Center, uh, government-sponsored. I mean, these are just some generic things. And the great, things about, great thing about cybersecurity, and I think you know, even with some of this convergence, is that um, a lot of things that I wind up doing one way or the other kind of follow this 80-20 rule. It's, you know, there's 80% commonality in a lot of different things, right? And I think that's the same with cybersecurity, too. I mean, you know. All systems have passwords. You know, all systems require monitoring, right? All systems, you know, should have services locked down that, you know, are insecure. So the great thing is, is the recommendations don't really change necessarily industry to industry. There might be some specific things with certain, you know, specific industry protocols or things like that. But generally, it's all the same, right? It's you know, it's know your assets, it's know what you're protecting, because if you can't, if you don't, you know, can't identify what you're supposed to be protecting, how do you protect it? Um, you know, Kevin mentioned, um, you know, know your assets, because assets change. Um, and a pro great story was um, some bank did, had an external company come in and do a network discovery, and, you know, they had all of their identified computers, and they just had this one computer with an IP address that was really chatty, they said, what is that computer? Nobody knew. They said, where is that computer? They looked all over the place for it. They couldn't find it. Turns out it was in a closet that had been sealed over with drywall. So there was a computer in the wall that had been there, and somebody left, and they forgot about it. It's a true story. Um, you know, secure co configurations. Sure, I mean, you know, anything that's known by you know, a large number of people, default passwords, any of that kind of stuff, you know, that's an entry point. Um, really, I think the, the big issue today is data sprawl. Um, you know, it's, it's data management, and that's 
um, something that, that's going to become more important as you know, it relates to privacy. Um, the discussion and the mention of terabytes um, per second of data that come out of some of these um, you know, new digitized systems. Well, that, that data sprawl and that data explosion is, is huge. Um, and you know, one of the things that we're big on is you know, managing that amount of data. And when you start talking about, you know, <laughs> literally it's funny, I actually found a site that is an archive for all these old games. Um, what, I don't know if anyone remembers Zork. Okay, so Zork is basically, it's a text game and you, you navigate by going north, south, east, west, and you, it's like, uh, it's like a, um, an adventure game. You know, you open the door, you pick up a key, all text, right? And they had that source code, um, and it was really cool to see it, you know, see the actual lines that like, you know, if walk, then do this, and, you know, but the point is, you know, those systems were, you know, beautiful, exquisite, but simple, right? And you look at some of the code now, I mean, there's so much code. Um, millions and millions and millions of lines of code. There's so much data, you know, and, and that Zork game, it was a beautiful game and it fit on a floppy disk, that probably one of the smaller ones. So you're kilobytes, right? Now it's megabytes, gigabytes. Now it's yottabytes, terabytes, zettabytes, exabytes, right? I mean, you can't even imagine how many zeros that is, but you know, what do you do with all this data, right? There's so much data flowing um, and it's a security uh, vulnerability if you're not really dealing with it. Um, so I'll move on from cybersecurity just kind of generally into some other major trends. Um, and all of this is kind of to show that <clears throat> the speed of technology coming out is happening so fast that it really the, the recommendation is to be diligent in whatever you're doing because you can be guaranteed that whatever you kind of finally fix now, in three months, it's going to be irrelevant, I don't want to say irrelevant, but you're going to have to move on to the next challenge. Um, this has happened in you know almost every position I've ever been in, uh, but it's moving so fast now I can't even believe it. You know, I mean there are some technologies that were, you know, came out of nowhere, were completely cutting edge, and then within six months to a year, they're commoditized and sometimes even potentially irrelevant or at least off the radar, right? Um, so you know, Gartner's a great resource for you know all things technology related. Um, I'll point out artificial intelligence is huge now. And I said before that they've been predicting the explosion. Well, the explosion is definitely happening now. There's no doubt. And, you know, I can give tons of examples of why that's true. But just the capabilities of AI in so many different areas is huge now. Um, the, the, the biggest thing, which also brings in privacy for me, is, you know, I started realizing six months or a year ago when I'm watching movies and talking, and then I do a Google search, and it predicts what I was just talking about. And I thought I was crazy and then until other people started saying, oh yeah, it's not even just like I'm in a browser, I search for something on Home Depot or Amazon and then Home Depot shows me that same object. Now it's actually speech, right? So my phone's sitting right here and I'm talking about you know, electric cars and then I, you know, I see something online. That, that is kind of scary, it's getting crazy, but you know, just to show you how powerful all this pattern recognition and and relationship building, then these companies live on it, right? Um, <clears throat> serverless computing, you know, cloud computing's been around for how long now? Big data analytics has been around for how long? You know, we're sort of moving on to these next things. Um, functionality as a service used to be platform as a service. Now it's, well, I have this function, you know, I want this function, and then the rest of it just kind of falls into place. The infrastructure builds it out, you know, the control aspects of it, all of these things. Edge computing, so you know, centralization, the pendulum always swings back and forth between mainframes, PCs, then it's cloud computing, and now, okay, now we've got all these devices. Um, great story from Carl, I, when he said, um, we can plug in a thousand batteries at a charging site, that, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. That's leveraging you know, all the, sort of the, the, the multiplicity of things, right? So same thing with computing power. I mean, you know, these two computers right now are sitting idle, my phone's sitting idle, so using that computing power, memory, whatever, for you know, active things is great. Um, everything's very global, uh, which is a cybersecurity issue too. You know, when you've got millions of devices, now you know, trillions of devices, um, you know, they, it becomes issues. <clears throat> okay. Um, so basic best practices, um, 
to me, the issue is getting to the point where humans individually cannot really help a lot of these problems. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was working at the Commonwealth, we switched internet providers, right? So the main pipes coming in the front door, we had an intrusion prevention device, which is, it's like a firewall, but it, you know, it monitors connections coming in. If it sees something it doesn't like, it kills it, right? Um, and they were, you know, we're switching from one vendor, they're switching over to another line coming in to another vendor. And I'll never forget, I won't even name names of companies, but there was an engineer and we had the, the, the IPS that was sitting there and he said, okay, we're gonna move this over, um, but for the transition, we're gonna do everything manually, right? And myself and my boss were looking at the logs and considering there was about 500,000 different connections per second, we said, well, there's no way you can do that. You can't possibly turn off this one until you have the other one in place because you know, there was an automated process there that was happening at you know, millions of times faster than any human could look at a log. So how is this applicable to cybersecurity? Well, it's kind of the same thing. It's, you know, technology's ramping up so fast, the good guys and the bad guys both have access to this technology. They're definitely using it. They're using, you know, tools um, like Showdown and all that to, you know, automate scanning and finding vulnerabilities. Well, the good guys need to use the same type of technology to combat the bad guys, right? So, you know, there are companies that are looking at cybersecurity from the AI side, but, you know, uh, every, that's kind of in its infancy. Um, increasing visibility, awareness, I mean, that's, that's always huge. If you don't know about it, you know, you can't really, you know, prevent bad things from happening if you're not aware that you're doing it. Um, awareness, education, um, for us it was always the financial aspect. It was, um, you know, we didn't have the funding to do what we needed to do. So we'd either have to be very creative, which we were, you know, which kind of comes to the um, you know, put your resources where they most matter. So, you know, that's risk management. It's, you know, this thing, if it crashes and goes down, it's really bad. So I'm going to put, you know, 80% of my financial and, you know, talent resources here. These are some other things, you know, if it goes down, I don't really care so much, or if it's, the impact's lower, don't care. Um, but it was still a struggle even just to get that basic level of funding. But now, as I said before, executive level at you know, most organizations realize the import importance of cybersecurity, so we get the funding. Um, but the visibility and you know, always promoting you know, why cybersecurity is important, is that'll never go away. <clears throat> okay, so on a little bit to what we're working on. Um, I've got about four minutes left, so I'll kind of go through this quickly. So we're basically building a platform that integrates data and applications, right? And when I say data and applications, I mean that very generally and generically. Um, you know, the typical paradigm is, you know, we've got a big data lake or database or file store, structured, unstructured, doesn't matter. We've got applications that do various things, websites, database, store procedures, um, what have you, right? Um, and in a lot of cases, the way they interact is centralized, right? So we have a centralized data store, we have a centralized application store, uh, and you know, everything's getting micronized. You know, um, virtual machines, Docker images, you know, basically compute platforms that can migrate and move all over the place. Um, you know, so you used to have a physical server on the floor, and now you have a digital one that sits on a disk, and at the push of a button, I can take it from this computer and move it over to this computer, right? So it's the same kind of concept. Instead of having you know, this huge pool of data, and then, you know, this application that does something, business process, financial transactions, whatever, um, we thought, well, hey, let's, let's start, my, you know, micronizing that. So our basic idea is we've got a piece of data, why not have it process itself everywhere it goes, right? So that's kind of the beginnings of it. Um, this is a, you know, very simplified example. You know, we've got all these data sources and actuators, right? So inputs and outputs, they connect to, you know, we don't make hardware, but we make software that goes on lots of different pieces of hardware um, that would actually process this data you know, locally at the edge, right? So um, the simplest example I always give is you have a temperature sensor. Normally you might have you know, a thousand of them all spitting out temperature results. They feed up to a big control system that processes it, does analytics, makes patterns, and then says, okay, you know, here's an output result. So all that data ships up to the central control, ship back out with a result. 
we're trying to do that locally, right? So we want that temperature sensor to be able to say, um, with each piece of data, have it tagged, as, as Kurt was discussing, um, <clears throat> of tagging individual pieces of information or devices with what's important about them, right? So if I'm a temperature sensor, I might have a very simple analytics algorithm in there that says, if it's between 80 and 120 degrees, it's normal. So tag it as normal, right? If it's higher than 120, tag it as high, and if it's lower than 80, tag it as low. The great thing is it's kind of pre-processed, right? So it goes into some other system. That system doesn't have to do that work, right? So uh, another good example of what we do is, today it's the brain, right, processes everything um, and tells the rest of your body what to do, but you still have a reflex, right? So if I touch a hot pan, the nerves here say, ooh, that's hot, I'm gonna take my finger away before my brain even knows about it, right? So that's essentially what we're doing is we're kind of building data and applications and networks that, are, that have reflexes, right? So um, if I'm a temperature sensor, I might be already telling that motor or some other mechanical process to switch off before the control system even knows there's an issue, right? Just as examples. <clears throat> so we're building this infrastructure, right? We consider this sort of a next generation infrastructure where we're taking compute power, we're building an abstraction layer there, and saying, okay, we're gonna be building this information infrastructure on top of it, which includes all kinds of things like algorithms, patterns, right? So we can actually label data either as a certain type of data, either as a certain time in a data's life cycle, you know, just got created. Who created it? Who owns it? What is it used for, right? These are some of the inputs. Outputs, um, this has been processed. We have found all this other data that is related to it, and the pattern is this, right? And we are basically facilitating that information flow. Right now it exists on the internet, but it's very siloed. Facebook doesn't share with Google. They all share with the government, sure, <clears throat> right? Um, but the internet's not designed for information. It's really just, it's a transportation layer. So we're trying to you know, add some additional functionality into that, and one of the major things is security, right? So on our platform, every piece of data is always encrypted, okay? Um, and it has little pieces of analytics in it, right? So um, another big use case for us is with health data, for example. So raw health data is, needs to be protected, needs to be encrypted, otherwise you're in violation of HIPAA and probably GDPR, um, G General Data Protection Regulation in UK, which defines our huge for companies, millions of dollars on violations. Facebook just got fined four billion, four or five billion dollars for their privacy violations. That's a big number. Um, and, you know, other things, the blockchain piece, um, I'm kind of running out of time, but that allows us to sort of put this monetary component too. So, you know, we can actually start defining different types of data and their value, right? And their value could be defined by abundance, it could be defined by um, the knowledge or the intelligence or the information that's in a piece of data. There might be data that, that's not very valuable because there's so much of it and you know we've kind of mined through it already and there's nothing really interesting there, but there could be this other piece of data that saves a company you know, $30 million in their business process. So that's very valuable data. And no one's really ever quantified you know, how valuable information is. In fact, you know, I've asked analytics companies, you know, nobody knows, you know, they sell their, their products with subscriptions, you know, but if they were to say, how much did you save this company over time? They still are not quite there yet with even knowing that, right? So this company implements Splunk or SaaS or some other analytics companies and, you know, their business revenue goes up, their costs go down, but, you know, could they tie them indirectly? It's tough to say. So we're kind of aiming to do something like that too. Um, you yeah, know, we're still in early stages, we're startup, we're in the process of being acquired um, by a larger um, portfolio company, uh, and then, you know, within the next two years, we're scaling up and we'll have our roadmap done, so. Um, we're basically building digital neurons, if you can think of it that way, where each piece of data takes inputs, does some process, and has outputs. Uh, I think I'm probably out of time. Uh, I'll say real quick, this was something interesting I found. Um, infrastructures of the future, because I, I love new technology and you know, even though the pace is happening so fast sometimes, but you know, I still like kind of um, looking at what's gonna happen, what's actually gonna be real 
Um, and some of these things are pretty interesting. You know, this was this is a picture of um, basically space-based power distribution, right? So there's something up outside the atmosphere that collects energy because it's you know it doesn't the atmosphere doesn't get in the way and then it beams it down, right? So that could be an infrastructure. Um, trillion sensor infrastructure. I mean, that's the big thing. Is you know, kind of the Earth is. You know, on the positive side, it's kind of waking up, right? So, you know, um, I don't know if anyone knows about the difference between IPv4 and IPv6. I don't know exact numbers, um, but the address space for V4 is almost exhausted. And for V6, they say there's 10 IP addresses for every atom on the planet. So I think we're covered. But still, I mean, it's one of those things where they say if something can be done, you know, or it's predicted that it can be done, usually will be done and it exists. So, I mean, that's kind of scary. You might actually be addressing subatomic particles, which is pretty interesting. Um, you know, certainly drone delivery networks, that's kind of already happening now. Um, micro colleges, you know, online, you know, our, my kids grew up with devices in their hands. They could be, you know, taking classes that are, you know, not centralized. Um, so, yeah, it's all great stuff. and. Cybersecurity will always be you know, a big component because in order for some of these more advanced technologies to actually function and work, that cybersecurity piece has to be there, right? Or else they fall apart. So um, that's all I've got. I guess questions later, right? Okay, some resources and thank you very much.